Revelation. Possibly you have a King James. I'll read it there too. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. Revelation 1 and verse 10. I became in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John, the apostle, was on the Isle of Patmos and he became in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now the question of it is, how can we become in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the first day of the week? And I'm going to suggest some ways that will help us to become in the Spirit and have something. See, the Bible says, no man shall come before me empty. If you don't have anything, you've misappropriated what God has blessed you with. Or you haven't been diligent about things. No man shall come before me empty. So we want to have something for the Lord Jesus and for God the Father. Now, there's some ways to become in the Spirit. The first way is in 2 Corinthians 3.18 is the first way. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is the first suggestion how we can become in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. But we all, looking on the glory of the Lord with unveiled face, we'll pause here, Moses had to put a veil over his face, but our Lord Jesus doesn't have a veil on his face. He has an unveiled face there in heaven. So we all, looking on the glory of the Lord with unveiled face, are transformed according to the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord the Spirit. Not the Spirit of the Lord, but by the Lord the Spirit. If you want to be transformed in your life, be occupied with that glorious man up there in heaven in order to become in the Spirit on the Lord. It's good to be in the Spirit every day, but at least to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the first day of of the week is to be occupied with that glorious man that's filling all heaven. See, the Lord Jesus even had a change in his body. When we see him, we'll not see him all beaten up and marred. No, no. We'll see him as he is in all of his majesty and splendor and glory. But we don't have to wait to get to heaven by faith. We can be occupied with that glorious man and we will be transformed. You want to be transformed in your life? The word is metamorphosis. We can be metamorphosis changed if we occupy ourselves with that glorified man, the man in the glory. See, heaven never had a man. We already said today, he's made, heaven has never had a man before, but there's one man in heaven. The man Christ Jesus. Notice I didn't say Jesus Christ. Same person. He is Jesus Christ. But coming forth in resurrection and ascension, he's the man Christ Jesus. The resurrected, ascended, glorified man. Mentioned 50 times. 49 times by Paul and once by Peter. Of course he's Jesus Christ. Of course he's the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course he's Jesus. Stephen said, I see Jesus. But in resurrection and ascension, he's the man, Christ Jesus. And if I want to be transformed, I have to get occupied with that glorified man there in the glory to become in the spirit on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. The second way that will be helpful this 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8. 
1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8. This is to observe the Passover before you get to meeting. You don't bring your Passover exercises to the meeting and talk about your sins and yourself and your blessing and your salvation. That's very nice. But the breaking of bread is not about that. It's about the Lord Jesus and His work and His worth and His person and His name and His beauty. So... We want to observe the Passover before we come to meeting. Uh, verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye, as the assembly is unleavened. The assembly is always looked at as unleavened. If there's any leaven in the assembly, we must purge it out, that we might become a new lump, because the assembly is always seen before God as unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, crucified for us? No, that has to do with the world. Of course he was crucified, but not for us. He sacrificed his life. Christ also loved the assembly and delivered himself up for it. Did you know the assembly is Christ's chief interest? The assembly is Christ's chief interest. So get occupied with the chief interest of our Lord Jesus. That's his interest. Oh, you thought I, I thought winning souls for Christ is his chief interest. No. It's good to win souls for Christ, of course. But his chief interest is the assembly. He saw this pearl of one great price. He sold everything that he had and he purchased that pearl of one great price. You said, I thought we were just wicked sinners. Well, we were, but as far as the assembly is concerned, the assembly was beautiful to the Lord Jesus. Selling everything that he had and purchases the pearl of one great price. Christ also loved the assembly, delivered himself up for it. So how wonderful that is. So during the week at your home, all during the week before you come to meeting on the Lord's Day, you know what it is to be under the blood. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. You don't have to rehearse that when you come here. If you want to, you can, but, and we'll probably say amen. But the Passover is always held at home. The Passover is always preparation for the Lord's Supper. Look at Acts 20. Just hold your finger here, Acts 20. The book of Acts, chapter 20 and verse 6. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were so closely related, the Lord Jesus calls them one and the same. Luke 22, verse 1 and Luke 22, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 6. We sail away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, which is also called the Passover. And came to them in Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. So the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, prepares us for the Lord's Supper. But that's held before you come to the meeting. All during the week in your personal life, in your home. Back in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast of, the feast, not a fast, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, with, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, the Passover the Feast of Unleavened Bread will help us to become in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 11 is a third thing. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. While you're turning to verse 28, 
The first thing is to be occupied with Christ in the glory. The second thing is to be in the value of the Passover and eat the, the feast of unleavened bread. Not a fast, but a feast of unleavened bread. That's the second thing, to prepare you and me to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now the third thing is in verse 28 of, Ma of 1 Corinthians 11. But let a man examine himself and stay home and don't come to the meeting? No. Let a man examine himself and refuse the emblems when they come by? No. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He wants us to do it. So self-judgment will help us to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. Let a man examine himself and refuse the emblems? No, no. That's unscriptural. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. If there was something so terrible in my life, I probably wouldn't even show up to the meeting until <laughs> I got it straight. But we come to the meeting, what for? To show forth the Lord's death. So we break the bread, we drink the cup, we show forth the Lord's death. Now, some people may not understand that, but that's what Scripture says. The first thing, occupied with Christ in the glory. The second thing, to be in the value of the Passover and eat the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the whole life of the believer down here upon earth. Would someone turn, would you turn to Ezra chapter 6 just to get a, a little glimpse of that? Ezra chapter 6. Ezra 6 verse 19. Ezra 6, verse 19. There was 49,697 people. Couldn't be done in one place, of course. Ezra 6, verse 19. The children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the month. Verse 22. And kept the feast, not a fast, kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy. Not crying. Not with sadness, but with joy. So even the brethren in the Old Testament, they observed the Passover and they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We don't literally keep a Jewish Passover, of course not. But morally speaking, we're in the value of the Passover because God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And we're feeding upon Christ. We're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. You say, we're not cannibals, all we know. But we're appropriating, we're assimilating the Lord Jesus and his things. Keeping the feast of unleavened bread. And then thirdly is to judge ourselves. The Corinthians neglected this and guess what happened to them? Many of them were taken home to heaven early. <coughs> And many were sick because they weren't doing it. Nobody's worthy, but they were doing it in an unworthy manner. They were having a love feast and some were getting drunk. And some had and some did not have. What, having not houses to eat and drink in and shame the house of God? So it was the manner. None of us are worthy. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. Christ is the only worthy one. But we do it in a worthy manner. Look at verse uh, 29. For he that eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner. None of us are worthy. In an unworthy manner. Eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we need to judge ourselves. So how wonderful self-judgment comes in. And if we judge ourselves, we be, we'll be more apt to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John 13 is the 
Is the next one, John 13? John 13, having part with Christ. Not part in Christ, but part with Christ. John 13, verse 8. The Lord Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. He's washing the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter in verse 8. Peter said to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So we must allow the Lord Jesus to wash our feet that we might have part with him in the assembly. We might have part with him in glory. Not part in him. If you're saved, you're in Christ. That can never change. The moment you got saved, you're in Christ. But this is part with Christ. One of his mediatorial offices is to wash the brethren's feet. The Lord Jesus is the great foot washer. He washes our feet by the washing of the water, by the word. So we want to have part with Christ, then you have to have your feet washed. Now, we know some Christians literally take a basin of water and wash people's feet, and they probably get a blessing out of that. But this is greater than that. This is by the washing of the water by the Word. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Speaking about having part with Christ. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25, the latter part, Christ also loved the assembly and delivered himself up for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing by the blood. No, that's only done once. That's judicial cleansing. But this is moral cleansing that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. See, now that Christ is risen, ascended, and glorified, he functions in eight different mediatorial offices. Most believers only know two. They know if they sin, he's their advocate. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father God. Thank God for the, his advocacy. If they've got to go to the hospital for an operation or they lose their job, they know he's their great high priest, and he is. But there are other offices too that he has. Take advantage of the Lord's present ministry. See, he's the bishop of our souls. He oversees the flock. What a ministry that is for the Lord Jesus. He has a headship ministry. He's not the Lord of a church. He's the head of a church. And from the head you get direction. From the head you get nourishment. From the head you get control. So he has a headship ministry. Now his lordship ministry has to do with the kingdom of God. And wonderful that he has a lordship ministry. He also is the minister of the sanctuary. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The word A is not in the Bible. It's just put there for smooth reading, capital M, minister of the sanctuary and of a true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity this man have somewhat also to offer. You see, the Lord Jesus is at God the Father's right hand not only to intercede for us, 
but to represent us officially as the minister of the sanctuary. You may give out a wrong hymn. Yeah, a lot of people do. They do. They just give out some hymn. Make me sing something somebody wrote 200 years ago. Why don't they get up and pray what they've composed during the week? Or what I've composed? How wonderful that is. Instead of giving out Mr. what Mr. Darby said. Now, so we have a wonderful hymn book. Of course we do. It's precious. We probably have one of the best hymn, hymn books in the whole world. But some people give out the wrong hymns. And so the Lord Jesus has to set it right because he represents us right in the very presence of God the Father as the minister of the sanctuary. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, For Christ is not into the holy places made with hands, which are antitypes of the true, figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. This is not intercession, this representation. He's the minister of the sanctuary to all of our prayers and praises and giving out of hymns. He sets them in the proper order right before God the Father. So take advantage of the Lord's present ministry have part with Christ. He washes the brethren's feet. He's our advocate. Any sin in your life? Confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he's the believer's advocate. He's the believer's great high priest to intercede, to support to sustain. He sympathizes with us. So he has a priestly ministry. And in his priestly ministry, he's the minister of the sanctuary, officially, to take our prayers and praises and offer them to God the Father in his acceptability. He's the bishop of our souls. He oversees the flock. We fail. The brethren fail. Jesus never fails. That's wonderful, isn't it? He also has a shepherd ministry. He gathers. Some people come in and try to scatter the saints. No, he gathers. So how good that is. How good to take advantage of the present ministry of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans 8. Verse 9. Incidentally, a good Roman can go anywhere in the Bible. If you don't have Romans, you don't have a foundation. There are more new truths in Romans than any other book in the New Testament. God's righteousness, redemption, forgiveness of sins, justification, reconciliation, and how one of the truth of Christ Jesus, wonderful truths in Romans. So if you don't have Romans, you're not established. You want to be established? Get the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh. But in the spirit, in Romans, if you're in the flesh, you're unsaved. Now, sometimes we might act in the flesh. But in Romans, we're not in the flesh position. We're in the spirit because we're saved. Romans chapter 8, if you're in the flesh, you're an unsaved person. But we're not in the flesh. We're in the spirit. Even though sometimes we act in the flesh, we should not do that. Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh. No, we're not. We're saved, people. But in the Spirit, we're saved. If so, but the Spirit of God dwell in you, and the Spirit of God dwells in every believer. 
But now there's something else. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, that's not the Holy Spirit. If many men have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of him. He's none of him. I'll look at Philippians chapter 1 about the Spirit of Christ. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 19. <clears throat> chapter 1. Verse 19 about the Spirit of Christ. For I know this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You say, well, the Apostle Paul had the Holy Spirit indwelling him for years. Well, what is this? Paul had to face King Nero. He wanted to have the same attitude, the same spirit as his Savior had when he had to face the Sanhedrin, Annas and Caiaphas, and Pilate and Herod. See, Paul calls a high priest a whited wall one time, and he wished not he was a high priest, and he took it back. So he wanted to have the same attitude when he had to face King Nero before he was beheaded that his Savior had when he had to face the Jewish hierarchy. Why, Stephen had the Spirit of Christ. He looked like the Lord Jesus. He talked like the Lord Jesus. When he was stoned, he had the same attitude as the Lord Jesus. He said, Lord, hold this not to their charge. He was just like Jesus. Are we just like Jesus? Do you have the Spirit of Christ? I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. The spirit of Christ is a spirit of humility. It's a spirit of lowliness. Selflessness. So Paul wanted to be just like Jesus and have the spirit of Christ. He already had the Holy Spirit for years. So we can have the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we do things in an unchrist manner. We don't want to do that, do we? If you do that, confess it. If you do it to a brother or sister in the meeting, go to that person and say, I'm sorry I did that. You know? So how good that we can have the Spirit of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 for the next one. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And this is a forgiving spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So we want to forgive one another. The Lord wants us to do that. He's forgiven us, you know. So we're going we're gonna to not, not forgive our brother and sister? Oh, no. We ought to have a forgiving spirit. So the Apostle Paul tells us to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. So have a forgiving spirit. Spirit. Just a few more thoughts. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Colossians 4 verse 2. And this will help us to become in the Spirit on the Lord's day is to continue in prayer. Each of us should have a personal prayer life. It's easy to neglect. It's easy to neglect a personal prayer life. It is. Margaret and I pray together audibly with her head covered in our bedroom. A 
Okay, so there's husband and wife can pray together audibly. Then there's family prayer. When we have four children around the table, we audibly prayed for them. They heard daddy pray for them to go to school and, and so forth and so on. So family prayer. Then there's a prayer meeting. The assembly prayer meeting. It's not just for men and boys. It's for ladies and children. It's for everyone. Not forsaking of the assembly of ourselves together. As a manner of some is. So much the more as we see the day approaching. So we want to be at the prayer meeting. Look at Acts 12. Acts 12. We want to continue in prayer. The book of Acts chapter 12. Verse 5. King Herod had killed James. Peter was put in jail, put in prison. And verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the assembly unto God for him. So we want to be at the assembly prayer meeting. It's discouraging to come to prayer meeting and no one is there. We want to be there. That It should be the exception if we're not there. Oh, I know there might be sickness sometimes. There might be a special examination you've got to take as a student. But don't, that ought to be the exception, not the rule. But look down, if you will. Look down, if you will, at uh, verse 11. Peter was released from prison. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he considered a thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of Mark, uh, mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. We call that a cottage prayer meeting. Maybe the whole assembly can't meet. So some of us can get together for a special prayer meeting. That's what they had at John Mark's house. John Mark's mother Mary opened her home for a cottage prayer meeting to pray for the release of the apostle Peter. So there's personal prayer for each one of us. Husband and wife can pray together. There's family prayer. There's the assembly prayer meeting. Continue the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Then there might be a special prayer meeting for about a special matter. So we need to continue in prayer. Prayer. Now we can pray directly to God the Father because the Father is the source of every blessing. We can pray directly to the Lord Jesus, but we never pray to the Holy Spirit. That's offensive. There's not a verse in the Bible to pray to the Holy Spirit. He would be embarrassed if we did. We don't sing to the Holy Spirit. There's not a verse in the Bible about singing to the Holy Spirit. Some people say, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. He don't fall afresh on anybody. That's unscriptural. Now, he's a person. He's, he's a divine person. He indwells every believer. But he magnifies the Lord Jesus. He glorifies Christ. He teaches us the scriptures. But we can pray directly to God the Father. We can pray directly to God the Son. So how wonderful that is. So prayer. Uh, go to 1 Timothy 4. Just a couple of more to consider. This is reading the scriptures. 1 Timothy 4 verse 13. First Timothy 4 Timothy 4.13 
Till I come, give attendance to reading. Reading what? Read the Bible. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. We need to read the scriptures. We need to study the scriptures. We need to search the scriptures. The Lord Jesus said that. It's good to memorize the scriptures too. They're very helpful. To memorize the word of God. See, if you would go to first five books of Moses, we have the figures of Christ in the scriptures. Moses is a figure of Christ. Aaron is a figure of Christ. Joshua is a figure of Christ. The boards in the tabernacle speak of the humanity of Christ. The gold speaks of the deity of Christ. The silver speaks of redemption of Christ. So the first five books, we have the figures of Christ. We go to the prophets, the major and minor prophets. We have the foretellings of Christ. 750 years before Christ died upon the cross, Isaiah 53 records that. Uh, Micah tells us the very Bethlehem the Lord Jesus would be born. See, there were two Bethlehems when he was born. It tells us which one. So in the prophets, we have the foretellings of Christ. Let's go to the Psalms. We have the feelings of Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, David could say. Deep calls unto deep, all, all of thy waves and billows rolled over me. That just wasn't David, that was the Lord Jesus saying that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, David could say. That was the Lord Jesus saying that through David. So in the Psalms, we have the feelings of Christ. You want to get some of the feelings of the Lord Jesus? Then read the Psalms. In the four Gospels, we have the facts of Christ. Matthew presenting him as king. Mark presenting him as servant. Luke presenting him as the son of man. And John presenting him as the son of God. The facts of Christ in the four Gospels. The book of Acts and the epistles, you have the fruits of Christ's work <coughs> through the acts of the apostles, the acts of the Holy Spirit. And then the book of Revelation, we have the future concerning the Christ. Not Christ, but the Christ. You say, what does that mean? Christ and his assembly. Remember, the assembly is his chief interest. So we want to be occupied with the chief interest of our Lord Jesus. So read the scriptures. Just one more. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24 and verse 25. This is attend the meetings. Attend the meetings. Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but encouraging one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. Something may be said at the meeting that you could never get by staying home reading your Bible. Because the saints are gathered. And the Spirit of God can use whomsoever He will. So something might be ministered. Something might be said that you would never get even reading books at home, which are wonderful to read books and read the Bible. But He wants us to assemble he says in the Old Testament, gather my people together, I might give them water. So this is the water of the word. So we don't want to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I might just mention in closing the assembly meetings, the breaking of bread as an assembly meeting. The prayer meeting is an assembly meeting. 
the open ministry meeting in 1 Corinthians 14 where two or three brothers speak, not three or four, but two or three is an assembly meeting. And then sorry to say if there's any discipline, that's an assembly meeting. Sunday school is not. Now I love Sunday school. I have Sunday school object lessons. I love to talk at Sunday school. But it's not assembly meeting. But and the gospel, that's not an assembly meeting either. But I love to preach the gospel. So how good to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a man of some is. I've given you ten things. Now you know what number ten is, don't you? Responsibility. responsibility. So now it's your responsibility. I've passed them on to you. I trust the Spirit of God might use them for your encouragement in order for you and me to be in the Spirit or to become in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. So may God add the blessing to His Word for His name's sake. Thank you very much. We'll be here Wednesday night, Lord willing.